Today, we will look into unusual cases out of Russia concerning encounters with UFOs and non-human intelligences, as well as several other strange mysteries. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mysteries with a History. We will be taken on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. And with each episode together, we will peel away the layers to look for the truth. When it comes to Russia, there's a lot to cover. I was really shocked in the stories and the cases that I came across, and I'm very excited to share them with you. Before we start, I do want to say thank you to absolutely everyone that had wished me to get better. I have been coming off of a cold since this weekend, so if I start sniffling or coughing a little bit, please bear with me. But let me bring in my co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade of Black Radio. Jimmy, happy Thursday. You're faking. She's faking it, everybody. She's fine. Look, she looks wonderful. J- accessorized. Hair is done. And he just, she's faking. She wants sympathy. She, you know, she wants, you know, uh, like, like, uh, is it D- uh, William? It's got to be William, right? Is it Will? What others, what other names start with W? William, Will, Walter, like Wal- Walter, could Bishop, be Walter, yeah, yeah, could be Walter, <laughs> Walter Bishop from Bridge. Classic, but thank you so much, W. Decker. I really appreciate all of Christina and Jimmy's hard work. Thank you both, and Beck. Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone that's catching this show live. Jimmy, I'm really, really excited for this show, and I thought it'd be really fantastic to start off, first of all, in chronological order, but also with a case that took place in 1977. And last week we spoke about jellyfish shaped UFOs. Well, Russia also had an encounter that I'm really shocked that we didn't cover last week. And this took place and please bear with me. I have never studied Russian, but it's okay. We're going to do this together. The Petro Zadovsk phenomenon that occurred September 20th, 1977. This was a first one for me, and I have an image that I'm going to share here with you. But have you heard of this case, Jimmy? I have. This is a huge case. Okay. Huge. Humongo. Humongo. And uh, so I'm going to not ask my question. I like the way that you went around it. You went around and and answered it before. But because this case, there it is, ties in with what is going on right now in our community, and that is jellyfish stuff, jellyfish. And this is jellyfishish. Yeah, for sure. And the the case is huge. And when I say huge, it covered, excuse me. Now you got me coughing. You like that? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And I will always fake it. I, I never tell anybody when I'm sick. I never do. I just go through it. I'll wait to see if somebody comments. Jimmy, Jimmy looks kind of <laughs> ill. Um, this case covered um, multiple countries, um, multiple air systems, uh, civilian and military, uh, air uh, and radio chatter uh, uh, across several militaries. Multiple witnesses, astronomers, towns, uh, 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 flight personnel at airports. Uh, It was in all of the newspapers uh, throughout the country. It was reported on the news. This was a huge case. Happened in 1977. And uh, and you said it uh, correctly. uh, The Petrozavodsk. Petrosavodsk, you got to get the D. The D needs to be pronounced. Vadatsk phenomenon was a series of events that occurred on September 20th, 1977. Now, when I say series, it's because it happened across multiple countries. And the sightings were reported uh, not only over uh, a vast territory, but a wide uh, part of the civilian population, too, as well. I mean, everybody reported this. Images were captured, like this one here. Um, And it was seen 
from Copenhagen in Denmark to Helsinki and then throughout the Soviet Union um, to the east. It was named after the city that you just mentioned, Petrozavodsk in Russia, which was back then the Soviet Union, where a glowing object was widely reported. Um, and they also said that rays were shot down at the ground from this object. And I find that very interesting. Um, it appeared in the upper atmosphere and moved all over the place. In Helsinki, in Finland, I said Denmark, uh, in Finland, the sightings of uh, the glowing ball were reported by newspapers in Ilta Sanomat on uh, September 20th and Kansen uh, Udeset the next day. The appearance of the UFO over Helsinki caused heavy radio traffic in the Soviet territory. Now, remember, Finland and, and Russia, the, the then Soviet Union, share a, a very long and extended border. The eyewitnesses, Christina, uh, they included paramedics, on-duty military, uh, personnel from the Navy, longshoremen at the city's port, uh, local airport staff, and also, I mentioned, an astronomer. It was also observed by members of the Izmirin Geophysical Expedition that was going on near Letka. In St. Petersburg, then Leningrad, by the way, they changed the name of the city, the sighting of the UFO was reported by three night shift employees of the Polkovo Airport, including air traffic controller B. Blagarev. Now, check this out. Blagarev stated that the UFO was surrounded by a spacious, rhythmically glowing coat with intricate structure. A follow-up investigation, this went on for years, by the way, and I'm leaving a lot on the table. A follow-up official government uh, uh, investigation into this, when you look at their description of, and this is official, of the craft, they constantly go back and report that it had some type of force field, some type of shield, some type of protection that was surrounding the object. And I find that part extremely interesting. Yes, uh, rays, they, they didn't say like ray guns or plasma weapons or anything like that, but it was projecting rays of light all over the ground. And they were being classified in a sense like golden tentacles. And they were a bunch of beautiful colors as well. And so people that were witnessing this, they the first thing that came to mind to them as we're seeing in this image is like a jellyfish or an octopus. And it gets more interesting because since this had this sighting had spanned about a thousand kilometers people were really curious on what was going on but not just that but they also wanted to get a response by the soviet union their government their their military on how they could explain this so there was a lot of investigations done over the years to attempt and explain away really what was going on and so what I came across was that according to the TASS journalist, Nikolai Milov, and what's really awesome is that I actually have an article right here. It's in Russian, by the way. And again, I do not speak Russian, but here is an article that's supposedly covering this. So if any of my Russianers are out there, that's not even a word, but I'm going to make it into a word, can read this and tell me it is from the article. I would appreciate that, but I did find it when looking up this case. And so what they were looking at, and, and in, in particular with the task journalist, Nikolai, he said that there were many people that looked decently ill in the minutes following the incident, a look that continued for hours afterward. And some of the witnesses who spoke with this journalist claimed that they uh, could kind of feel some kind of electric current running through their body when the arrow-like lights appeared. And this is something that really caught my attention is that this is just another case where certain people that have a UFO encounter get 
ill right afterward. So there, there is a connection there, but even stranger were that these lights, when they touch the ground and sometimes in like windowsills, they left rough holes. And then some of the witnesses recalled the object descending even closer. So then you have multiple residents and they saw a bulb shaped object detach itself from the main craft and set over the rooftops of the local houses and buildings as if performing some kind of reconnaissance mission. And then it continued to do this for several several minutes before returning to the main craft and some witnesses claimed that it disappeared into an opening on the underside perhaps suggesting some kind of remote controlled drone but following this according to the statements given by the director of meteorological <laughs> station of that area by the name of Guri Gromov the object, quote, gradually assumed the shape of an elliptical ring, and then it began moving once more, heading to the bank of nearby clouds in the direction of one of their lakes in that area. And as it went into the clouds, it left behind a red hole as if the clouds had been burnt and remained so for several minutes. Now, later investigations would show that there were no records of any aircraft over the skies of the town on the night in question, and Gromov dismissed it uh, that it could have been just ball lightning or any other atmospheric phenomena, which we have heard that time and time again, and maybe it could have in some aspects, but it doesn't necessarily explain how the journalist by the name of Nikolai, once again, when he was in speaking to the witnesses that had seen this jellyfish type UFO, how many of them got sick afterward. But it gets even more interesting because the Soviet government, recognizing the significance of these reports, they conducted an official investigation into the phenomenon. And scientists involved in the inquiry proposed various explanations ranging from rare natural phenomena like an unusual form of northern lights or a meteorite to more unconventional theories. However, there was no definitive conclusion that was reached, leaving the door just completely completely open to speculation. But Jimmy, it gets even stranger than that because years later, when people are still having this interest in this, in this encounter, in this sighting, there was some glass that was found near one of the buildings that looked almost warped, that just looked incredibly odd. So there was one publisher by the name of Vasil Zakharetchenko. That's probably not at all how you say that, but we're going to continue onward. He, uh, during, <laughs> no, well, as Jimmy laughs at me right down below, but what he noticed when he was speaking to people is that in the ground and on the windowsill, there seemed to be like that was glass that was melting where this, where these rays of light came down from this object. And a factory window was so bizarrely twisted that it was removed for analysis. So then a doctor by the name of Azhara in 1981, he gave a lecture noting that not only did the glass show signs of melting, but that the windows themselves were dis significantly distorted. So there were other scientists that looked into this and they couldn't really give an explanation. But what they did notice is that the glass had this like crystalline structure when originally that glass was non-crystalline at all. So that was something that really, really caught people's interest. And I do want to say, uh, James, thank you so much. And Jessica, thank you so much also. And just really quickly, there's not going to be any shows next week. I'm going to be out of town visiting some family. So just make a little note of that on your calendar. There will be a show tomorrow, but no shows next week. All right, Jimmy. So when you're looking at this information, what really grabs your attention when it comes to scientists looking at this years later? Yeah, the, the the situation uh, when we back up and look at not only the investigation but the original reports that were coming in, um, the airport employees and the flight controllers that reported the object uh, called it an object. They never called it an aircraft. They were never able to identify the structure. So there was that part. What was seen uh, over Finland and over Helsinki 
uh, was different than any other explanation. Also, the directions um, that the the flight path of this was the opposite of some of the claims that were made by the military that was trying to suggest it was a rocket launch. And the rocket launch and the direction of the rocket was the opposite of the flight path that was uh, reported from the ground and what people were seeing. The article that you posted up was about some of the claims that were made by the official military saying that it was a rocket launch that was putting up a satellite. That was not the case. And uh, all of the information that was in uh, the, from the military in the uh, official investigation, it was the opposite. So the the flight path uh, from Finland over Russia and the flight path of the launch of the rocket went against each other and against the grain. So you can remove that. The military was doing their best uh, to debunk this, saying that it was a rocket launch. Also, uh, the rocket launch and the timing of the rocket launch, which did happen, was not at the same time as the reports that were coming in from the airports and civilians and also the official military. So, which caused, and if you go back and look at all of the original uh, newspaper reports and, and, and the media reports at the time, the timeline of the sighting in the sky is confirmed. The timing of the launch of the rocket is confirmed, and the two are very, 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 very far apart. So that's not what happened. It wasn't the satellite that was being launched by the Russians at that time, or by the Soviet Union, I should say. Um, now, uh, back to this uh, this other part. The, uh, the original sightings that happened over Finland we're describing an object, Christina, that came down from the atmosphere. Okay? So they watched it enter Earth's atmosphere and then move across Russia. Not the opposite with a rocket launch, right? You are going up and out through the atmosphere. And all of this can be confirmed. We can look at the facts and and come to our own conclusions. This was something that entered Earth's atmosphere. What was it? We don't know. Um, it was multi uh, multicolored, uh, uh, very, very, very bright. Um, and this... Uh, uh, again, which is in the official investigation, the reports of the civilians and the astronomer and the flight control uh, all described some type of, uh, I'm going to say it, like a, a shield that could be seen around this and that uh, there were reports that you could see the structure of the craft behind this shield. It's a very interesting case, and it's very, very, very well documented. It's one of those cases that really did catch my attention, and I think a great place to start for our show today, talking about UFOs and aliens referring to Russia. But, Jimmy, um, many people are saying in the live chat about feedback. And remember, we actually spoke last week about this, and Annie says that it's also occurring on your other shows recently, too. But in, does it happen when I have my mic open? I'm asking these people in the live chat, are you hearing that feedback only when I'm speaking? Uh, I just want to make that clear and just want to get that fixed if we can, because you know what? We want to give you the best quality shows possible. So yeah, I have, I, I'm just going to let, since we're doing this in real time, uh, I have uh, echo cancellation on. Uh, I've got the background noise down. I don't have anything active. So, um, or anything that's, you know, so, and I say everything sounds normal to me. Uh, coming in here. So I, I I don't know what that could be. Okay. Sounds good. So getting, I, I want to give a really fun fact actually about this uh, in general. And that is, so when this was, I'm going to maybe I'll go a little back. When this was all going on in 1977, this is when the USSR 
changed the term from unidentified flying object and replaced it with the term anomalous phenomenon for research purposes. So when we when we use the term UHP, that people are like, oh, this is such a brand new term. Why are you confusing people with this from UFO to UAP? But Russia has been doing this since 77. And I thought that was a really fun fact. And I have another fun fact for you a little bit later because I love fun facts. They're the best. <laughs> as Jimmy giggles in the background. But um, something else that I, I, I didn't want to mention, uh, just very quickly back to that glass and the holes that were seen and finding crystalline structures, because later Western scientists, including Dr. Dale Kirkshank and sociologist David Swift from the University of Hawaii, as well as Professor Manfred Cage from the Institute of Scientific Photography, analyzed the glass samples as well, and they confirmed the presence of crystalline around the hole's edge. But here's the crazy part. They had mentioned, all people that had looked at this, they had mentioned that it is practically impossible to have the glass change from non-crystalline to crystalline and seeing it on the edges of these holes. And let me tell you, I love, I do, I really love it hearing when scientists say it's impossible or nearly impossible and yet it happens. Like, ah, it, it makes my day like almost every single time. And this particular case is no exception to that. And this is Another thing that caught a lot of people's attention. So in one aspect, you have people getting severely ill after encountering this. And then you are finding physical evidence of something that is nearly impossible to happen naturally. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and this is one of many reasons to why this case is still being looked at today is because of those factors. It's not just eyewitness account is not just a wobbly photograph of a blob in the sky, but there's so much more to this case that people think there must be something to it. Now, could it be completely natural, like a meteorite or something of that nature? And it seems that there's a lot more to this case than maybe we understand just yet. But Getting into our next case, and probably one that a lot of people think of when they imagine to themselves Russia and UFOs, and that is Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal has, well, first of all, it's classified as a hotspot in that area, but there is one very, very famous story that, of course, we're going to cover when it comes to Lake Baikal. But at first, I like to just kind of lay a foundation of this area before we get into the stories. So here is one just beautiful image of the lake. And so it's the deepest lake, the like, so it holds the largest volume of fresh water globally. And it is the deepest lake in the area being about 5,314 feet or 1,637 meters. And local lore suggests it is bottomless and connected to all the world's oceans, seas, and rivers. And deep within its waters, legends speak of a silver castle, which is the Siberian god of death and ruler of destinies. And this mysterious lake has long been associated with strange occurrences as well. Because starting out in 1904, according to the book Russia's USO's Secrets Unidentified Submergible Objects in Russian and International Waters, it says here that in 1904, there were descriptions of black objects with searchlights, colorful rotating wheels, and cigar-shaped craft performing complex maneuvers and apparent landings. And workers of the Transbaikal Railroad also reported mysterious spheres with rotating searchlights. But it gets even weirder, Jimmy, because in one case in May of 1964, near the area of Lake Baikal, an anti-aircraft missile unit about 250 kilometers from Ulan Udi witnessed a strange event on the night of May 17th and 18th, which they saw an unexpected glow that rose from the lake spreading across the area distinct from any natural phenomenon or sunset, and the military initially thought it was a forest fire. So soon after, 
they lost all communication, experiencing only very strange interference. And from the lake's direction, a fiery orange sphere emerged, pulsating and emanating a radiant glow comparable in size to the midday sun, but less intensive and visible without eye protection. So the military unit, they went into alert. They're freaking out. They're like, what's going on here? And... As the situation escalated, only regular phone lines remained operational to reports to their commanding officers, which is really bizarre, by the way. But as the fiery sphere advanced, it emanated a glow resembling a burning fog, engulfing everything in its path. And the commanding officer at the military installation near Lake Baikal ordered radiation levels to be monitored every 30 minutes with reports sent to the command center. And so soldiers, they wore gas masks and protective gear, but absolutely no radiation was detected. So the sphere glowing like a telegraph pole height moved closer to the unit, dimming as if expending some of its energy through its radiance. And while when it enveloped the military base, the commanding officer ceased attempts to identify it and instead ordered a lockdown, isolating the compound from the outside world. And this is just one detailed case of a good handful, and we're going to cover some more. But I do want to say that right now we have 629 people watching this live, only 263 likes. If you're enjoying the show so far, or if you're from Russia, hit that like button right down below. It lets us know that you're enjoying the show. Now, Jimmy, looking at this location, have looking at Lake Baikal to be very specific, there have been a handful of UFO sightings, UFO encounters, alien encounters as well. Would this be a place that you would like to visit and maybe even scuba dive if given the opportunity? You're on mute. Now you're still on mute. There's no audio coming through. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. You can? Yes. Yes. Wow. Now there's a feedback loop. Now there's a feedback loop. Okay. Yes, I, 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 echo. I have no idea. I'm going to do this. <laughs> While Jimmy's fixing his microphone... You okay? You got it? No, I still can't hear you. Me, what is going on? Got it. What I'm I'm back? Is there a feedback loop? No, it sounds good. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. There is a gremlin in the system. Or it's that ghost that lives in your house that likes to play with your shoes. I said, when you said I'm muted, I'm not muted. And then I watched you mute and unmute me. I saw that, but, but I'm just, just sitting here drinking coffee. And now the echo's gone. You're going to blame that on coffee too? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so anyway... Baikal has such a rich history of, of sightings, of contact, of paranormal, the supernatural. Uh, it's part of folklore. It's part of the mythology of the region. They, this goes back uh, a thousand years or, or maybe longer. Um, it is indeed a very special place. It is the largest uh, freshwater source on planet Earth, it's huge. It's a mile deep, uh, largely unexplored, and it's it's huge. It's just a large, large lake. And with all of the sightings that have happened uh, with the military and uh, with uh, civilians and, and people of uh, different towns in the region, um, there's obviously something going on. And when we go back to your report was from 1964, we have to remember one thing, that the Soviet Union, uh, being a controlled state, 
and group of states, the Soviet Union, the reports that we got from anything were only through official channels and state-owned, like TASS, uh, the news agency, from the military, you know, an official controlled situation. We never heard from the civilian population. And the civilian population only got reports on the news that came from the Soviet Union. You didn't get anything that was independently uh, uh, broadcast or, or written. Everything was controlled. So isn't that interesting that the reports that we have in and around Lake Baikal are all from official sources? Okay, that 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 adds a lot of. I hate to say it, when we're talking about the Soviet Union, but it also allow uh, allows for real credibility, because the Soviet Union did not release anything. Everything was controlled propaganda. So if it got out there, it really happened, and so that that's why this 1964 report and others uh, from the military around Bacall were, were so important. Which brings us to one of the most famous. I'm going to say infamous too, as well. Famous cases in UFO history. And which has been covered. I have covered it on my show. We've covered it here. It's part of your uh, uh, images that you used uh, for the show today, which is 1982. 1982. Now, I have heard uh, interviews uh, with these divers. I've gotten the translations of the interviews from the divers, uh, from my relatives, direct uh, translations. Um, uh, it's it's uh, been translated and, and put into books. And that is, of course, seven Russian divers in 1977 or 1982, seven Russian divers were uh, in the lake um, and they were doing some research. Uh, and about 50 meters underwater, which is about 150 feet, by the way, a uh, little side note, 150 feet when you're scuba diving, that's max. Okay? To go below 150 feet, now you need it, it, deep water, very special dive gear. All right? So that's the maximum. So when you when you hear 50 meters or 150 feet, that that's it. The body cannot handle anything below that. Okay, so that's a, a very key part of, 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 of this incident. So 150 feet underwater, strange humanoid creatures appear from the depths. And they come up. And they tried to capture one of the divers. All of the divers are then, are you ready? Pushed up by a force. Pushed up. Pushed up out of the area and uh, back to the surface. And, and to hear the divers talk about this, to go from 150 feet, and they tried to kidnap one of them. And I've, again, I've, Listen to the interviews and and uh, for them to talk about this in 1982, which was again a controlled state. This was the Soviet Union. You don't go and say things like this unless the incident actually happened. Was it as the divers reported and what what they experienced is what they experienced. And so. Just to kind of emphasize the scuba divers and being propelled up, this is very significant because then they had they dealt with decompression sickness. Because when you are a scuba diver, when you're doing any kind of scuba diving, you have to take your time going down and coming back up to acclimate to the pressure in the water. And so another key aspect that is so significant with this story is one, as the case goes is that it's believed that these divers working for the USSR were attempting to capture these entities in the water. And there's a legend in that in Lake Baikal that it's like a half 
man, half shark that lives there. And so these scuba divers, they're going in and they see allegedly a handful of them that look kind of similar to this as we're seeing on the screen here. And then as that was going on, all seven divers, they were propelled up, not giving them any time to decompress. And so when this was, when they reached the surface, they had to immediately be placed in chambers in order to avoid death or any kind of decompression sickness. However, there were only four chambers available. There were seven people. So tragically, three divers um, didn't make it and they died on shore, on shore. And this is just another key detail to this case that makes it so significant, that makes it so intriguing, and that catches a lot of people's attention to continue researching this case. But it just also, it's another drop in this bucket of water of all of the strange things that happen in and around Lake Baikal compared to other parts across the globe. This location could be classified as a UFO hotspot. Here's the thing. All right. I love saying that. Were the divers there because of the extraterrestrial alien humanoid presence? Right. Or were they there researching something else? and then encountered them? That's the question. And my mind, uh, when I look at this case, it's not a coincidence that the divers were at that location at that time and made this contact. I think they were going to make this contact, that they knew what they were looking for, and, and there's talk that... Yes, that was the plan of the mission and 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 so forth. I have not interviewed the divers, right? I have not. Uh, a couple of them have gone public and and you can hear their stories and you can read uh, what they have to say. It is I have come to the conclusion that they were there to make contact. They know about the base, they know what's living in the lake and they know what is there. And the divers saw exactly what they were expecting. The part that of this case uh, that is so fascinating is that they couldn't go any deeper and that they were forced back to the surface. That was That's the interesting part about this case. This is our world. This is our lake. You're just visiting here. And I think that that was the message that they got. And that's what happened. We haven't heard anything about any future contact in Lake ba Baikal since 1982. But here's a little fun fact. And I have another one after this one. But Vladimir P uh, Putin, he went in a miniature submarine to go to Lake Baikal in the early 2000s. Now, he didn't mention exactly what he saw, if he encountered any strange beings, but he did have a desire to go. He did, and he made it back in one piece. Now, I have another really fun fact for you. And you can probably tell that I'm not from Alaska, and I found this really interesting, referring to the Alaska Purchase. And I learned about this from a trivia game app that I play on my phone. So much fun. Highly recommend just any trivia games. But here's a little fun fact. Because Alaska was purchased... By, uh, by the United States from Russia back in 1867 for only $7 million. So the United States was paying two cents an acre for Alaska. Now it's worth about $37 billion. But what's crazy about this is that if, if you just look at how close Russia is to Alaska, like you would say, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. And I got to find my image here because – you just like you usually just think that Russia's on the other side of the planet. It's incredibly far. But when you look at this map, it puts everything into perspective and you think, oh my goodness, you could just take a little boat and get yourself to Alaska. And that's my little fun fact. And I I know I'm not the only one that didn't know about this. Look yeah, there, there are five miles. Well, no, there's that, but there's also uh, two islands. If you go down, uh, it, it's not here in, in the Bering Sea. 
uh, to the south. There are two islands. One's Russian. One is in the United States. And they're like four miles apart. That's right. You can throw a rock. You can yell, yo, Vladimir, <laughs> from one island uh, to the other. Now, uh, back to your previous fun fact, and your fun facts are pretty good today. Um, and when Vladimir, when Vlad, those that, are, you know, we, we just call him Vlad, you know, his inner circle, Vlad. He, he was head of the KGB when he went to Baikal. Think about that. Why would the head of the KGB get in a submersible in a freshwater lake? Why? Well, you know, he does ride Siberian tigers. You know, he's 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 a pretty manly man, I guess. But yeah, right? Think about that. Why why would you risk there there's there was a reason to do that. You're not just like today I'm going to go get in a submersible and I'm going to cruise down below crush depth. No, you're not going to do that unless there was a reason to do it. And he was head of the KGB. Yes, before he became the Russian president, well, the prime minister and then president. It is really interesting, that little tidbit right there. Right now we have 750 people watching. Can we get to 400 likes? It really does help support the channel, the algorithm, and all of that fun stuff. While you go ahead and do that, we're going to move on to our next case. And this one, and what's really interesting is actually in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of cases, a lot of sightings that were happening in Russia, but also just across the globe. It was just like a hot time period for UFO sightings. <clears throat> and Lori, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to share my screen here and we're going to get into this one. This one was also new to me. So let's are, are we this. doing height? Are we doing height? Yes. Yes. Yes, we are. Height 611 or 611 UFO incident that took place in 1686. So we're looking at that time frame, 70s into the 80s, it was whack. So in January of 1986, there was there's a small town in Dalengortsk in Primorsky Kari. Dude, I am flipping fluent in Russian. And it became the site of a UFO crash, at least allegedly. And the event that remained relatively unknown until 1995. And it was then that an American ufology, ufology TV series called Sightings brought the incident known as Height 6. 11 UFO incident to public attention, revealing compelling evidence and intrigue, even the most skeptical observers. Now, let me just back that up a little bit. This sounds kind of similar to Roswell. So while it took place in 1947, it was buried rather quickly. And then it was Stanton Freeman who brought the whole case back to life to where now it is the most famous case in the world. Thanks to Stan. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, this Right. This is very similar. It took place in 1986, but it wasn't really known about until 95. So the incident occurred January 29th, 1986, when over 20 people witnessed a spherical object flying at speeds exceeding 120 miles per hour. The object abruptly lost control and crashed into Limestone Mountain, also known as Height 611, bursting into flames and remaining ablaze for several hours. A few days after the crash on February 3rd, a team from the Academy of Sciences we've mentioned them before already, by the way, arrived to conduct an investigation. And they discovered the crash site measuring 6.5 feet by 6.5 feet, covered with a strange black film, lead mesh fragments and beads. And although they took detailed photographs, they turned out blank upon development. Dun, dun, yeah, dun. That, that's, that's an interesting part about this case. I mean, they... They documented, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, in and around this case. Um, and a lot of witnesses, the, the entire town. Uh, uh, the, okay, we'll circle back to that. But they show up and they photograph everything. Films blank. All of the film 
different rolls of film. It's all blank. The radiation levels in the area were all correct. So it wasn't like radiation fogged the film. There wasn't any radiation levels uh, that were out of normal. And that that was an interesting part about this case. Um, the, uh, the reddish ball was seen by the entire town. Everybody saw it. And it was about 8 p.m. Everybody's awake. Everybody saw it. Everybody was talking about it. Eyewitnesses said uh, that it appeared in the sky the same size as the moon. That's a big ball. Okay? All right. Now, I just want you to put that in your mind's eye that you're looking. You know how big the moon is in the sky. And the object that you are seeing move across the sky is an object that is glowing orange and is the size of the moon. And they watched that come down and crash into the mountain. Now, it's a depth of field thing, right? So an object that is the size of this guitar pick, I always use guitar picks, right? And you can adjust that to the size of the moon, but is this the size of the moon? No, right? It's a question of uh, depth perception. So from the town to the mountain, and if the object was the size of the moon, now we've got a general idea of how big the object was. Very, very interesting uh, part about this case. The ball was flying parallel to the ground. Okay? Parallel. So it's going like this. It's parallel. It's not coming down. It's flying. It's moving across, it's moving parallel to the ground. Um, nobody except for one witness in the town said that they heard anything. All right? All right? It was completely silent. One of the witnesses says they heard it crash into the mountain. The other eyewitnesses said, no, they saw it crash into the mountain, but they didn't hear anything. So I find that very, very interesting. Um, it was later determined that the speed of the object, uh, like you had mentioned, uh, was somewhere between 30 and 100 miles per hour. So it's moving very, very, very slowly. And that it was um, flying at about uh, 1,500 feet above the ground, parallel. That's a third of a mile. So it's very low. It's very, very low. When the when the object came to, uh, by the way, height 111, uh, height 611 is the name of the mountain on a map. Okay, so it's just called height 111. Um, it started to descend and move down and then crashed into the mountain or the hill. Um, some rocks. Now, Christina brought this up earlier. Let, let's circle back to this. Some of the rocks at the impact site had drops of a silvery metal, which was determined to be lead. The type of lead found on Height 611 is different from the lead found in the local lead deposits. So it wasn't the lead from the mountain that was found in the debris field. That's interesting. So that was brought in from the object. Also, that black glassy stuff that Christina uh, was talking about, they found that all over the place. Drop-shaped beads, drop-shaped, okay? They weren't round. They were teardrop-shaped. Um, and they talk about these mesh fragments, mesh. What, what, what is that? So are we picturing, we don't have any photographs of this, but are we picturing something like, Cloth, fishnet, you know, something looser. Maybe what, angel hair. Uh, could be that. It could be a, a, a ball of, of of something, right? Like angel hair, or you know, a, what what are they referring to here? Mesh is repeated quite a bit in the research that has gone into this. Um, in all, they had approximately seventy grams of lead five grams of mesh fragments, and 40 grams of beads. 
All right. The radiation level, like I said, of not only the objects collected, but of the area was normal. I, and I, I have to go back to uh, the, the point that the researchers that were there were working for the government took all kinds of pictures with different cameras. All of the all of the film turned out to be blank. Chemical analysis of the beads show they were mostly composed of lead, silicon, and iron. Some of the drops contained significant amounts of zinc. Dun, 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 bismuth, Uh uh-oh, right? And rare earth elements. An analysis of the soil, rocks, and burnt wood taken from the landing ground, burnt wood, right, was also performed. It noted that the chemical composition was similar to the composition of similar samples taken from the site of, dun, 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 Tungusta. Now, for those that don't know, why is Tunguska relevant? Why is it important? Probably the biggest explosion outside of Japan in the history of the Earth. Okay, that's why. And we don't know what what caused it. We don't know. What we do know about Tunguska, again, Russia, right? (laughs) Siberia. Um, That uh, we have photographs. Uh, I believe it was 1911. I could be wrong, but but right in there. We have photographs of uh, the area. All of the trees were leveled and felled. What uh, uh, the, the ideas behind this, and we don't know, lots of theories, was that a meteor uh, uh, entered the atmosphere and exploded over Tunguska. Uh, 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 a craft, a flying saucer, exploded over Tangusta. Was it uh, some type of weapon? Was it some kind of atmospheric natural thing? We don't know. It was hundreds of square miles of leveled forest. All right, now they went in, they tested, they took soil samples and everything else. And to have these elements and the data collected uh, from height 611, and the data is similar to the Tungusta e- event, is very interesting. It is. And you were really close. You guessed 1911. It was 1908. So, oh, oh, oh wait. Uh, yeah. No, super close. I mean, that was that was better than my guess. It just <laughs> if, I, if I had to go from memory, you killed it. Um, now, with this location and with this particular case, in the following year, more UFO sightings were reported near Height 611, sharing similarities with the 1986 crash. And three years later, another UFO was reported to have landed in the same site. And so these ongoing sites fueled speculation about the crash's significance and theories about UFOs being drawn to that very unique terrain. Somebody just said uh, Putin wasn't uh, uh, head of the KGB. You know, I, me personally, I don't care. <laughs> in, in that mi- misreporting or misquoting or whatever, uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter. Okay. But I appreciate everybody's attention. And that is the level of intelligence of, of this audience, Christina. They're very smart. And they listen to everything. So while he wasn't the head, he was the lieutenant uh, colonel before resigning in 1991. And he was a part of the KGB for about 16 years. I just yes. had to look that up. But then on... July 25th, 1998, Yeltsin appointed Putin director of the Federal Security Service, the FSB, the primary intelligence and security organization of the Russian Federal Federation and the successor to the KGB. So, Jimmy. Correct. Yeah. Technically, I'm correct. Yes. Technically, I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Yeah. In and around height 611. And the the interesting thing uh, for me when it comes to Russia, uh, former Soviet Union, 
is the amount of land that we're actually talking about here. Russia's big. Okay, Russia's big. It's you think China's big? China's teeny compared to Russia. And and China's huge. And when so when we when we talk about this kind of land mass versus the population of Russia, the popul- population is very small. And so you have people on the east coast, right? On on the ocean. You have that then you have everything that's going on on the west side, St. Petersburg and Moscow, right? So you have those two extremes. But it, it, the middle part of Russia, there's nothing there but prisons. There's nothing there. It's it's so remote. Uh, there are most of Russia, no humans have ever set foot on. So the, the the amount of 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 land and and sky space and and star and everything else it's huge. There are sightings and pockets of hot spots and UFO hot spots all across Russia. And if you're going to hide out that and you want to hang out on land, Russia is a really good place for ET. It is. It is. It's, it's a lot like Canada, <laughs> right? It's a lot like Alaska, where you have these concentration, right? But you have these huge masses of land in between where there's nothing. And anything can go on there. Anything. And Russia's got that. It's got it with height uh, 611 and a couple of other areas like Lake Baikal and other areas that we're about to discuss. I've, I just find that fascinating. People don't understand how big Russia is. Got a couple of cities, right? <laughs> you got a couple of cities and then just wide open spaces and uh, mountains. And it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's a country. handful of time zones as well. Fun fact about China only has one time zone and that is, country is ginormous i do want to say sandy thank you so much for becoming a youtube member and mark Tasaka, thank you so much oh always. mark's in the house mark's in the house Tasaka. thank you for that so next i let's cover for noich for for noich i had to use the pronunciation help for that one and i, and oh, I felt pretty cool you, saying it did you, so you didn't say <laughs> no, I, I, I used I used the internet for this one. So let's get into this one. This, one's, this one is really cool. This one's a more famous case when it comes to Russia. And for this particular one, I really want to hear your viewpoint about this one. Because I know that you've covered it. You've looked into it for years. You've also spoken to people about this case. I and have. You're better than any encyclopedia. So I want to hear it from you when it comes to Vernoich, the UFO yeah. incident that involves aliens and children. One of my favorite parts about this case, ray guns. That's a pretty cool little. It's, it's little got a, it's got ray guns in it. And yeah, so uh, this was an ET sighting. Uh, by these four boys, and we've got them right here. Um, that happened on September 27th. Everything in Russia is in September, by the way. <laughs> Apparently, everything happens in September. This was September 27th of 1989. Now, I've mentioned TASS now, T A S S, a few times uh, during the show today. It's very important because we're talking about the former Soviet Union and Russia. TASS was the official news service. So anything that got to the West, anything that got into the media, anything that we talked about always came from TASS, the uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union's uh, official news agency. So according to TASS, the boys were playing football in a city park. And this is a quote from TASS. This is a quote directly from the state-owned newspaper. The boys saw a pink glow in the sky, then saw a deep red ball about three meters in diameter. The ball circled, vanished, then reappeared minutes later and hovered. The children claimed to have seen... Are you ready? 
a three-eyed alien, which you can see here in Christina's uh, image, a three-eyed alien. The alien was wearing a bronze pair of boots. Now that's interesting. I this you is can get your boots. Yeah, he had bronze boots and had a disc. This is their words. This is from Tass, a disc on his chest, which is again in this illustration. Also, so is the ray gun, by the way. And he had a robot buddy with him. And that's also that's a good picture. It's got everything from the original reports. Dun, dun, dun. James <laughs> Scott. Um, and, and, but he had a robot partner that was with him. Now, the children said that the alien used his ray gun to zap one of them, a 16 year old boy, and made him disappear. Okay. And once the robot and the alien turned and got on the ship, went up a set of stairs. Oh, 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 there's the stairs in the doorway right there in this image, too, as well. The door closed. The craft took off. The boy comes back. He, he, he demolecularized. And then re-molecularized. You like that? Say that. Say that. Say that twice. No, thank you. You can't do it. Can't do it. Neither can I. I'm not going to do it again. I I got lucky. I got lucky twice. Um, it, it's 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 a well documented case. We've got the kids. Uh, we've got their images. Uh, Tass reported on it. It went into the Russian news service. And uh, the Soviet Union's new service. Um, and yeah, yeah, I love this case. Ray guns, disc, robots, you know, disappearing death rays. Yeah, this case has it all. It's a crazy one. And even the Russian police got involved to try to understand what was going on, listening to the children. And with TASS, which, by the way, is Russia's largest government-owned news agency, they reported the incident on October 9th, 1989, when this case took place in September, specifically September 27th. So they were sitting on the story for quite a few days. Yeah, about little a week. sketch, little about sus, a week. <laughs> as they say today. And so the story's sensational tone did raise a lot of suspicion, but TASS never concealed or at least intended to fabricate it. Now, could they have? Depends who you ask. But with this, um, there was one journalist by the name of Vladimir Lebedev handling the story. And he interviewed witnesses and experts, including the three children as well. And they... They were all interviewed separately, and they all drew similar sketches of the UFO, and they described it instead of cigar-shaped, as we are hearing more frequently that language used, they described it as banana-shaped, which to the journalists believe that it added credibility. Kids that have had sightings, and we've covered a handful of schools that have had their own UFO sightings consistently, researchers, ufologists, interviewers, they all take, they, they, they peel the kids apart like a banana, and they do separate interviews with them and require them to create drawings of what they saw. And most of the time, they look very similar to each other. It doesn't matter the country that it took place. We can talk about Zimbabwe. We can talk about the UK. We can talk about Russia. It doesn't matter. This, These steps that are taken are consistent across the globe. And it's amazing when kids have sightings because they do not have the same mental filters as adults where they are attempting to understand rationalize what they're seeing when it comes to children they're going to tell you how it is for the most part now yes sometimes people will use the excuse that kids have very vivid imaginations and they make stuff up as they go but when you are having children draw or sketch the same thing side by side it's impressive i i 
would say it is credible, wouldn't you? I do. I do. I like this case. And remember, the Soviet Union at that time, well, they still do it, but uh, especially at that time, controlled everything that the public knew. All of it. They still do. We, we, there's different accesses uh, that are out there, but they try to control uh, as much as they can even through today. But back then, if TASS was reporting on something, you're talking about a level of approvals and the need and the want to get this information out. If they didn't want the public to know about it, they did. the public never knew. And so if they wanted this case squashed, if they thought it was both, whatever the reasons were, it nobody would have ever known about this case. Cass reported on it. That's the part it, we have to constantly go back and look at the timeline here and what was going on. Also, fun, fun fact, since we're doing fun facts today, Cass released this story the day before my birthday. Dun, coincidence. Dun, dun. coincidence coincidence i think not i think not what was i doing october 10th 1989 i don't remember <laughs> anyway Tass, what was the reason to release this story everything Why was about a week later yeah, everything is about propaganda back then, Christina. Everything is about propaganda. How to damage the West, right? And promote the Soviet Union. And you're not going to talk about UFOs and ET and children, are you? Unless the situation is based on fact. They did a lot of interviews. Um, the KGB was involved. It was probably Putin. The KGB was involved. Uh, the police were involved. The state was involved. They investigated the case, and then TASS reported on it about a week later on October 9th. It's a fascinating case, and it's a great case. It is. Something that I do want to emphasize, actually, before we move on, talking about why it took them a week to release this information. There are a lot of journalists across the the planet that sit on cases that sit on stories for days weeks months sometimes years for different reasons some of them can be to just collect more information as more information becomes available others yes have to do with a kind of narrative but i with this particular case maybe just maybe they were just holding off on it to receive more information to see what the police had to say during this time frame to get all the interviews with the children as well. Maybe the kids didn't want to tell their parents until days later. There are so many factors here. And so we, we can't put all of our eggs in one basket and say it's definitely this versus this. So a lot of journalists, if not the majority of them, at some point in time have sat on a story for a long period of time for completely different reasons. The next case we're going to cover isn't particularly one event, but it's actually a location by the name of the M Triangle. And it's a secluded forest in Russia, also known as the Perm Anomalous Zone. And I'm going to share my screen here for this next one. There it is. And this is, this is, this is, this is amazing. It's so cool. Everybody's going to ab about to get their learn on right now. This is crazy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. So this particular secluded forest has had everything. It's seen it all. To be fair, to be fair, forests in general, the majority of them are spooky. There's a lot of secrets and a lot of strange things take place there. Just want, just want to say that. But Russia is no exception to this. They also have their fair share of just the bizarre. For instance, there have been UFOs seen in the area. There have been their own versions of Bigfoot called the Almasti. I feel like I said that right. I feel pretty confident on that one. But on top of that, 
even cell phone usage is typically impossible in the M triangle, except for a specific area known as the call box, which calls can be made globally. Now you might think to yourself, it's the forest, there shouldn't be any kind of cell service. Yes and no. You're able to get very faint stuff uh, in a lot of forests, not all of them, but in this case, there's only one area in the entire forest called the call box where you can make any calls or do any texting that you have to do. But this mysterious zone located near the Ural Mountains and about 600 miles east of Moscow was off limits to civilians until 1988. You have to ask yourself, why? 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 Yep. Why? 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 Well, okay, so... Similar to the idea behind Area 51, I'm just saying, right? We have our own exclusion zones here in the United States. Uh, the, these, these places are all around the world. You can find them in the United Kingdom. You can find them in Australia and in Canada, certainly in China, and of course in Russia. But this is, I would say... Russia's Area 51. This is where you go. Christina, you go to Russia. You got your passport. You're flying to Moscow, Makba, right? You're flying to Moscow. And you are going UFO hunting. Do you know where your Russian guide is going to take you? No. Well, Yabka. That's where you're going to go. That's where you're going to go. That's where you are. This is the guarantee you need the guarantee, right? You need the written guarantee, UFO sighting. You go to Malyapka. That's right. You go to the M Triangle. Absolutely. This is it. This is where it's at. I would definitely go. Now, also here, there have been like strange lights seen, dark figures, flying spheres, and um, animal mutilations as well. And it's just considered Russia's prime location for UFO sightings with locals accustomed to these mysterious events as part of just their daily lives. And so the area's history of strange sightings dates back over a century under the Soviet uh, regime where several expeditions were sent to the M Triangle, but their purposes and findings remain largely unknown. And the lights observed in the sky vary in shape and behavior, sometimes hovering for extended periods. Some UFO enthusiasts speculate that the area's former uranium presence in the mineral-rich mountains might attract UFOs or cause mass hallucinations. So visitors often report, report feeling a strong energy force, either positive or negative, and experienced unexplained phenomena. That sentence right there, what comes to mind first, is Sedona. Okay, that that that's what came to my right. mind. Now, not, not the part about uranium, but the part of the strange energy, usually positive, and experiencing unexplained phenomena. But it continues because it was quote officially discovered in the 1980s. The perm anomalous zone is located near the Maliakba. Maliakba. Mal. Don't say Mal first, then Yabka. Okay. Malyabka. Oh, yes, man, you sound like you were born there. Heck yeah. Malyabka. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so it's a village that was found in 1787. And the zone covering about 45 square miles of the dense forest was first brought to attention in 1980, like almost 100 years later, when a local resident witnessed an object falling into a pond, creating a massive wave. Now, notable observations include a purple ball uh, that was seen by a leading Russian ufologist in 1984. There it is again, the 1980s. We can't escape it. But scientists have suggested that magnetic field changes could be responsible for the area's anomalies possibly caused by electromagnetic energy from the Earth's lower layers, which I think is rather interesting to consider because it doesn't it doesn't explain away, explain away the Bigfoot sightings there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so now let's take things to uh, the next level when it comes to this area. All right? Can we do that? Can we let's do that? Do it. 
Let's do it. People talk about their the feeling of weightlessness. People talk about the gravity changing. People talk about the feeling of floating instead of walking. And all you have to do is go to the area to experience this. Now, isn't that isn't that fascinating? That's my and, childhood dream right there is floating right, and flying. That's everybody's. And and so when when we get into the definitions of what paranormal is or what supernatural is or what extraterrestrial is and anomalies and, and phenomena, uh, you know, what are these definitions? We have the pop culture version of it, and then we have what people are experiencing, and then we have the Oxford Dictionary definitions, right? But when you start to say things like, well, you know, you go there, and and you float you you feel lighter you feel different in in this zone in this area well that's when people start to look at you like you know are you but this is this is some of the phenomena that has occurred around the world but people talk about this all the time is it a vortex is it a special place we have the zone of silence in mexico we have uh, you mentioned Sedona. We have Joshua Tree. We have Mount Shasta. How many cities, towns in the world have a house, have a street where things roll uphill? Right? And it, 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 this this isn't anything new. And this is another part of uh, the, uh, the M triangle that I find extremely fascinating because you can tie into everything else that is there. Right? And if, if, if you if you put a list together of, of of hot spots and places to go in the world, the M triangle is on that list. There's no question about it. You can look for your ETs there, but there's uh, all of I'm talking about ET biologics there. But you've got uh, flying objects. You've got the glowing balls. Um, you've got shape-shifting humanoids that have been there. Some people uh, uh, constantly talk about uh, people disappearing, time loops, time changing, all of this going on in the M triangle. Um, I think. I think. You know what? It's out of this world. I'm going there. I'm just going to say it. It's out of this world. This is where you want to go if you want to check out the strange. So if you live in Russia or want to visit Russia, this is one place that you definitely have to stop at. No exceptions. But probably so, they go in the summer. We're, we've, got, we've got time for a few more. I've got one that I want to bring to the table. Okay. Okay. Can I, can, I, can I do that now? Absolutely. The floor is okay. yours. Okay. Early into now, we went in order. Okay, so I'm jumping ahead in the timeline a little bit. But in 2012, 2012, a crashed titanium object described as a UFO fragment was retrieved from a forest in the vicinity of, are you ready? Hmm. Ultra Denesquaya. Okay, it's what? a rural. That was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good. Rural locality in a, a blast. After a, uh, strange sounds were heard by everyone in the area, and then on uh, December of uh, the the object was. Let me back up. The object was retrieved in 2012. The object was seen and heard crashing on December 11th of 2011. Is it is it like this big kind of cylindrical shaped object? It is shaped like a U. Okay. And I'm it was to look up an image. It, it was attached to um okay, so uh, you got it? You got an image? Yes. Let me see it. Let me see what you got. Let me see what you got. Okay. I'll continue. 
Oh, oh, she's bringing up images. I want to see this. I want to see how close it is. That's it. Whoa, you got the image image. Wow. I thought it was going to be like an artist. All right. No, no, there it is. That's the object. Okay. Shall I continue? Keep this on the screen. This is great. And this is according to Pachner One. That's how that's how I speak Russian. Nice. <laughs> it's like we're living so, in Russia. So yeah, yeah. So does everybody else right now. So in 2012, uh, in the first quarter of 2012, the object was retreat. Remember, it's snowing. It was fine, you know, right? Okay, so um they they went into the area into the vicinity of where everybody saw the object come down and crash into the forest. They heard it, they saw it, but it was in winter. So then they go in, they do the expedition in 2012. The object was seen, like I said, December 11, 2011. So they go into the woods, and what do they find? They find that, a U-shaped uh, device that was attached to this half round, and you can see it here, section. Um, it was looked at, it was investigated, it was tested, it was made of mostly titanium, right? But it wasn't space technology. It wasn't aerospace technology. Nobody in Russia, uh, in in Russia, this is Russia, not the Soviet Union, of, could identify what this object was. Nobody knew. It wasn't space debris. Nobody knows anything about it. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And there we, it is. Do we have the, an idea of how big it is? Um, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. We're going off my memory here. So please don't test me. Why do you got to do that? Because oh, people were asking, and I was like, oh, I also want to know about yes, average on how room, big this was. The chat room is smarter than you and I combined times 10. Okay? You and I are just hosts. We're just here representing. <laughs> That's all we're doing. Um, somebody will pop it up here in, in the chat really quick, uh, the size of the object. But... What, what I always found fascinating about this case is I was told about this case originally from relatives of mine, and and I went back and, and did the research into this, and it was just one of those cases that I've always been fascinated about. And so, yeah. Uh, Josh says, not true, Jimmy. Oh, it's true. You guys are smart. We're, we're just here. We're just here representing you guys. All right. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, give me a little something, get your education on and, and go and, and do some research. Let's talk about Ukraine. Uh, let's squeeze this in before we run out of time. Um, 1982 intercontinental ballistic missiles in Ukraine deactivated. Uh, it's one, it's one of my favorite cases. It's so, let me just say this for this particular story. Whatever was going on, there's a level of humor, a sense of humor into this. And just I just got to blast it out there. 1982, the 80s. This was a crazy time. Okay. Yes. Like, insane. So according to the book, UFOs and Nukes, Extraordinary Encounters at Nuclear Weapons Sites by Robert Hastings. And people always bully me how I say nuclear, but I don't care anymore. I used to care, but now I don't. Continuing onward. So we have retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Patinov, also referred to as just Plutonov in some sources, recounted to ABC News an hours-long UFO sighting on October 4th, 1982. And he described the UFO as resembling a classic flying saucer, similar to those depicted in movies, with a completely smooth surface and no visible portholes. So he noted that the object was silent. It had very precise movements, unlike anything he had seen before. But here's where it gets really crazy, because during the UFO's presence, a number of nuclear missiles at the base unexplainably 
activated. So the launch crew were witnessing an unauthorized, an automated launch sequence initiate, counting down for 15 seconds, okay, before it just casually aborted and returned to standby. So let's 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 imagine this for a second. All right. You're doing your job. I don't want to imagine. Do you know how close we came to re- a really bad day? Yeah, to World War III. I mean, it's insane. Now, if if you are glad that no nukes just dispersed from Ukraine, hit that like button right down below. It's going to 600 likes right now. We have 800 people watching this live. So let, let's have a little fun, Jimmy. Let's just imagine this for a second. You're doing your job. You're watching all your nukes. You think that you're on top of the world at night. You are in control. Why? Because when it comes to launching missiles, you need more than one person to do it to initiate it. All right. You have keys in different locations. They can't reach arm in arm, that kind of deal. So you're casually minding your own business, drinking your hot cup of coffee and some scones. Cause why not? And then all of a sudden you hear bow, 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 15 second countdown of missiles ready to just launch on planet earth. I would have a heart attack. My heart would fall to my feet. I would pass out and then cry, okay, and then wallow in my pool of tears and drown. I would be so scared. But then all of a sudden, after 15 seconds, it just stops. Everything goes back to normal. And... (laughs) And then a UFO was seen just right outside. But then another retired officer by the name of Colonel Igor Chernovshev reported the control panel signal lights indicating missile preparation for launch lit up during this period. And he emphasized that such lights would normally only activate following orders from Moscow, highlighting the unusual nature of the situation. Why? Because Moscow, they never said, all right, it's time, guys. That never happened. That never, right. that never went down. So That's the right. incident was later featured in Soviet UFO secrets revealed in 2004 by the History Channel. And then Dr. Yuli Platov, a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, we just can't escape them, can we? No, we can't. Revealed that an official investigation concluded the object was actually a military flare despite the initial perceptions of it being a UFO. Yeah, allegedly. And now, right, heart attacks, 15 seconds, Armageddon, right? DEFCON, and, excuse me, and this is going on. And then, at the last second, everything comes back online. So, what do you see when you look around the the missile complex? Uh, tears. In the middle, no, you see a lot of wet pants. That's what you see. I mean, that what 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 goes through you? Nobody, and I mean nobody, nobody, nobody on this planet, nobody. I'm saying nobody. I mean nobody wants nuclear war. That's the end of everything. Even if you're a really, really, really bad person. And you're living, uh, you're running a, a, a country and you've got all this crazy stuff going. All that ends. Your good time and your bad world, all of that, they don't want that to end. Nobody does. Nobody does. So it, 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 it's, it's it, and to have that moment, if you're in a nuclear silo and that's happening, nobody wants that. No, nobody. And and to have the end of everything about to occur, you're going to wet yourself. I'm telling you, you can be the most hardened colonel, captain, major, general in any military in the world. You've seen it all. It comes to that moment. You know, nobody wants that. And they were all relieved. I, I guarantee. <laughs> Both I, ways. I, yeah. 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 <laughs> Christine, another great show. Thank you so much. Did we get to 600? I wanted 1,000 today. Oh, we got to, oh, right. What? Six, 611. 
Six eleven. Good job. Good job. Good job. Tonight on Fade to Black, I'll see everybody on Fade to Black. I've got Dr. Jonathan Young. He's back with us. Of course, star of Ancient Aliens since uh, its first season. And tonight we're going to talk about modern folklore. He's great. I mean, he's one of the smartest people out there. And uh, he's a professor. He's a PhD. But we're going to talk about a lot about what we're doing right now, modern folklore and mythology and 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 pop culture when it comes to et and and high strangeness and and how how things get written how things get repeated and how stories get told we're going to do all of that tonight with the one and only jonathan young so i'll see you guys tonight christina have a good one thank you thank you Another great show, as it is every single Mysteries with the History, but this one was really interesting. We covered a lot of incredible cases, and many of which I was not familiar with. That's one big reason to why I love doing these shows, is that I'm able to, at the very best, catch up with UFO history. And I have to ask you, out of all the cases that we covered, which one was your favorite? For myself, it was actually the last one that took place in Ukraine now, during that time frame in the 1980s was still part of the Soviet Union. And that's why we covered it. But it's just one where while we think that we're in control of these very destructive weapons, it doesn't really seem like we are. And Ukraine is not an exception. There are countries and cases from all over the globe that ha have had similar instances happen. Now, not entirely the same, but a good example of this is the Vandenberg incident, the Maelstrom Air Force Base incident, just to name a few. But there's a bunch more. And this one has always caught my attention. One that I always thought was interesting. Yeah, in the back right here, I actually um, have pound cake. <laughs> it makes me feel better on the inside and on the outside as well. Like, you know, when you're a little sick, you just want to have comfort food and pound cake and hot chocolate. Like, that's just the way to go. Ross, thank you so much for that. But that is it for today. There will be a show tomorrow, which will be uh, Strange News. But there will not be any shows next week. I'm going to be out of town visiting family. So just make a note of that. No shows next week, okay? Scan this QR code. We're in 2024, baby. There you can find all of my social media links everything that you need. Also, the Discord with 3,000 other like-minded members. So your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. Also, Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies. And of course, Instagram at strange paradigms. Now, if you need help relaxing, meditating, or using your imagination to wander the universe, take a look at my music channel called Cosmic Portals. It is a space ambient music channel. If you just scan this QR code, you will find that, or you can just type it in on YouTube. And that music that I create helps me with my insomnia, and hopefully it can help so many of you as well. But that is it for today. I will see you tomorrow. Be safe, and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.